Thanks for the for the presentation and yeah, thanks for uh, coming to this talk. Um, so as said, uh, um, what I would like to discuss about today is this idea of like studying causal models and specifically studying causal models at different levels of abstraction and being able to relate that. So be able to like take advantage of models that are defined maybe with different levels of resolution or different, different levels of granularity. Okay, so um, I, I have divided this presentation in three parts. So the first three parts, the first two parts are sort of like more like conceptual or theoretical. So we will first define what we mean by causal models. And specifically, we will go very quickly over the definition of structural causal models. Then we will introduce the idea of abstraction. So the idea of relating models uh, to each other. And then we will see how we could make this formal and precise. And then the last part. So the last part is probably the, the most like practical and applied. And, and discuss how we could learn abstractions between causal models and how we could take advantage of it. And we will see a specific application of these to um, an applied problem related to battery modeling. Okay, but first of all, okay, let's, um, let's define what we mean by causal models. So what we want to do is to have a definition, a way to represent uh, systems uh, by modeling uh, causal relation between them. So we know that in general, whenever we have a system, what we uh, try to do is to capture its behavior through models. And often like the models that, uh, that we define comes from a sort of trade-off that we have to deal with between the sort of knowledge that we have about the system that we're studying, so our priors, and on the other side, the, the data, the amount of data that we have, or the amount of data we can collect. So very roughly, we could uh, define a sort of ordering of models according to these two dimensions. So on one side, we may have models that are extremely uh, prior light. So models that are extremely generic, such as neural networks. And then we can uh, vary the, the amount of knowledge that we can inject in our model and have uh, more and more like defined and refined models up say to models such as uh, differential equation models where the entire dynamic is completely specified and determined by our knowledge. So in this sort of like ordering and categorization of uh, models, we, we consider uh, structural causal models which give us a specific trade-off between the sort of priors that we can use and the sort of the amount of data that we can collect. So structural causal models are normally graphical models in uh, which we uh, insert or inject prior knowledge in the form of causal relations between variables. And this comes with a number of uh, advantages, a number of like computational and statistical advantages. Uh, first and foremost, I think, uh, is the ability of discriminating between correlation and causation. So this is one of the really strong point and the strong like arguments in favor of causality, the possibility of yeah differentiating when uh, variables are just correlated between each other or have a relation of cause and effect. And this is particularly important if you don't want to do just prediction, but you want to control a system. So you need to know what, to, what you can act on. Uh, they also allow us to reason about interventions. So interventions is the way in which we affect our control and system. And structural causal models, as we see, have a very specific, a very precise and formal way to define interventions. And similarly, we can also move beyond just intervention and think about counterfactuals. So a structural causal models give us a formal way to reason about alternative uh, outputs or alternative reality. So it allows us to ask questions such as what would have happened if we had done something different from what uh, actually happened. Um, so this idea of studying the um, a system in terms of uh, basic statistical correlations, intervention and counterfactual forms what is normally called in, uh, in the field of causality ladder. And it's due to the idea that uh, observational questions 
interventional question and counterfactual questions are substantially different and you you have to um, rely on different formal machinery in order to answer each one of these one of the um, one of the sort of uh, uh, negative sides we can say like that is that often working with structural causal models requires more uh, either more data or uh, the possibility of injecting more knowledge so if we compare with other like graphical models like bayesian networks uh, structural causal models require either the definition a more precise definition of uh, the the graph uh, structure itself or the, the function to define the, the structural causal model itself okay uh, this is like the idea or the reason why we want to study structural causal models. So the next thing I'm going to do is just give a very quick definition of structural causal models. And this, this is like this uh, sort of the formal definition. So I'm giving it just in order to show you that these models are very well defined. What we will mostly do in the next slide, though, is just rely on like the graphical representation of these structural causal models to study them. So. Formally speaking, a structural causal model such as M is this tuple of four elements. So the first element is, which I call here X, is a set of endogenous nodes. And this is basically a set of variables that we are interested in. These are variables that we care about. These are variables that we can observe. So this, this is the phenomenon that we are trying to study. The second element, U, is a set of so-called exogenous nodes. So these are nodes that account for the stochasticity of the system that we're studying. So this represents like factors that affect the outcome of the system, but we cannot observe, we cannot control. So they represent the sort of noise in the system. The third element, F, is a set of structural functions. So this means a set of functions, one for each endogenous nodes that we have in our model. So in this representation, we have as uh, solid nodes, the endogenous nodes, and as uh, dotted nodes, the exogenous nodes. So for each one of the endogenous nodes, we have a deterministic function that gives us the output of this node once we have its inputs. And finally, we, as the fourth element, we have a set of distributions and we have specifically one single distribution for each exogenous noise. So these four elements give us a complete description of a structural causal models. And if you, if you look at this, basically what a structural causal models does is defining a system and separate very neatly, very precisely, a part is completely deterministic and in our system, which is described by these endogenous nodes and their deterministic function. And the part is completely stochastic, which is the part of the exogenous nodes and their distribution over them. So once you have a model like this, when you, when you have a graphical model represented as in this slide, what you can do uh, is simulate your system. So this gives you the complete description of the model. So this is your model, and then you can simulate it. And simulating means simply like sampling from your exogenous nodes, forwarding the, the values that you have sampled and compute the, uh, the output over your endogenous nodes. And so uh, if you see this process, at the end, what you get is also a probability distribution, not only on the exogenous nodes where you have defined your distribution, but also on the endogenous nodes. So what you get is a push forward of this distribution over the endogenous nodes. And what we get at the end is a joint distribution over these variables. So this gives us the complete like description of a system. And as long as we run the system in this way, we have the observational behavior of our model. But as we said, one of the things that we care about and we want to do is also thinking about the possibility of intervening on a model, on a system. And so what we get now is a precise definition of intervention. So what we want to do now is to formalize the, the act of performing an experiment of intervening on a system. So 
we, we use this syntax to describe an intervention. So we use this operator called do, which is applied to one of our endogenous variables, which receives a specific value. So for instance, this would be an intervention on node t setting its value to one. So what the intervention does is two simple things. So the first thing that it does is it removes the incoming edges in the node on which we intervene. And the second thing that it does is substitute the structural function of this node with the value, with the constant that we have decided to uh, fix. So if you think about it, this, this act of cutting the edges incoming in these nodes, it makes sense, right? Because these nodes represent the inputs to the node. And if we intervene, the value of this node is not going to be determined by the other nodes anymore, but it's just going to be the value that we have decided to set. So every time we perform an intervention, we are transforming our model. So our original causal model is being transformed to our intervention. We have a new like graphical representation, a new graphical structure, and a new function in the model. So this means that if we now observe, if we, if we now run this model, so if we sample the noise and we forward the noise, we will get a different distribution of our endogenous noise. So this is a very important like point of uh, the, the theory of causality in structural causal models. The idea is that, so if we study the model before the intervention, we get a certain joint probability distribution over the endogenous nodes. But once you have performed an intervention, you will have a different uh, joint distribution over the endogenous nodes. And this, this if you think, makes sense because uh, if we have a model that we just observe, uh, letting it follow its behavior naturally, it will um, give us samples that follow a certain distribution. But the moment we perform an experiment and we vary the system, then distribution that we will observe will be uh, different. Okay, that's that's basically all that we need to discuss about structural causal model at this point. So as I said, there is, there is more that we can do with structural causal models such as counterfactuals, but we won't, uh, we won't deal with it. So let's let's now move to the other the other important idea in this work. So the other the other important idea is the the idea of abstraction. So uh, this this relates to the fact that systems may be represented and modeled at different like levels of abstraction. And this is like this is not a new idea. This is something that is extremely common both in like everyday reasoning or in science. And I think probably the, the, the most common example or maybe the most successful example comes from physics or thermodynamics. Um, and here the, the idea is that, for instance, if you're trying uh, to model a, a, a gas, uh, so you, you can have two ways to represent it. So you can have a microscopic description of, of your system where you model like you can model the position and the momentum of each particle in your um, gas, or you can have a macroscopic description of the same system where instead of modeling each particle individually, you just look at macro descriptors of your uh, model, such as pressure, temperature, and volume. And it's, it's, it's indeed one of the big like results of thermodynamics to show that these two descriptions are consistent between each other. So you can, you can start with this description, study the evolution of, of your system and move to the high level description. And you will get exactly the same result as if starting from uh, the macro description at the beginning and observing its evolution. So one, uh, one of the problem is uh, that um, what we would ideally we would uh, like to do is to be able to work at the same time with multiple levels of abstraction. So we would like to be able to move across representations, possibly move uh, not just to extreme representation, but also intermediate representation with the guarantee that this shift would be consistent, that the results that we get would be meaningful. 
So, so this, this is basically the, the fundamental idea of abstraction. So the abstraction, yeah, which by the way, as I said, it's not, it's not a new idea. I mean, maybe the application now to structural causal models is new, but this is something that has been done in the sciences uh, widely. So this has been also called multi-level modeling or multi-resolution modeling. And, and so, so the idea, indeed is to be able to move across multiple level of representation. In a way, if you want, you can think a little bit as what like modeling or machine learning does, which is normally going from a set of inputs to a set of out outputs, so going in the horizontal dimension. So what we would like to do now is also to be able to move like in the vertical dimension. So being able to relate models that have a different level of granularity. And there are different reasons why we may want to do it. So one, one reason is that we may want to be able to aggregate data that has been collected, say, by different research group with varying levels of resolution or using different protocols. So this would allow us to make data collected by different groups or models developed by different groups compatible with each other. There is also the possibility of using abstraction just to, allow, well, not just, but also to allow us to shift between uh, levels of abstraction in order to use the level that is more convenient for us. So as, as, as it's easy to understand, like each level of this ladder of abstraction will have a different computational cost according to the sort of resolution that it provides us with. So if we if we have a certain objective, if we have a certain like quantity to compute, we may want to be able to move to the minimal or to the least expensive level of abstraction that allow us to compute the answer that we want. So to minimize uh, computational uh, effort and energy consumption. Okay, so now let's uh, let's try to make this uh, this idea of abstraction a little bit more formal in relation to structural causal models. So what I'm going to do is try to present this idea through this uh, very simple toy example, which is actually very common in, uh, in the abstraction literature. So so we will consider two models that are supposed to represent the same problem or the same system. That is uh, uh, a scenario of uh, lung cancer. So we will have just a few variables. So S will represent whether a patient is smoking or not. Uh, P will represent sort of like environmental factor related to peer pressure. Uh, no, sorry, just environmental factor uh, related to the, the environment where someone lives. T will represent whether or not the patient has star deposit in the lungs. And finally, C represent whether the patient develops lung cancer or not. Uh, so it's a very simple model. We, we have two, again, very basic models. Uh, a slightly more um, complex one on, on the top, which we call the base model, and a simplified one that basically uh, eliminates one of the variables on the bottom, which we call the abstracted model. And um, again, to simplify things in this example, we will also assume that all these variables are just binary. So they're just going to be zero or one, uh, but this is not a limitation of, of the, the framework in general. So the framework will work with any sort of uh, uh, finite domain, actually. Um, and OK, in, uh, in the literature now, there are a number of um, uh, frameworks that have been proposed to formalize this idea of having a map from this model to this other one. These are the three main proposals that are available in the literature. So what we are going to do is to focus on this uh, framework called alpha abstraction. OK, so what we're going to do in the next slide is basically give a formal meaning to this dotted out. So we want these two models to be connected to each other precisely. OK, so, uh, so this is a little bit of content, but if we go step by step, it's going to be quite easy. So first of all, so we define an abstraction as this tuple of three elements. So the first one, R, is a subset of variables in our base model that we consider relevant. So if we look at our base model here on the top, it was made up of four variables, P, S, T, and C. 
and we decide to consider only a subset of relevant variables. So these will be the variables that will be involved in the abstraction. So in the example, R is this, is this set of orange variables. So we decide that S, E, and C are the ones that we care about mapping to the lower level model, while P will be discarded. The second element is A. So A is this map between variables and precisely it goes from the set of relevant variables to the variables in the abstracted model. So this is, simply tells us where the uh, variable S will be mapped to. So in this case, S will be mapped to S prime, T to T prime, and C to C prime. So this map A is represented by these green arrows. So this, this is a very simple and basic, basic example. Uh, I want to point out that we do not need to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. This would be very limiting, right? But in general, we could have multiple variables in the base model mapped to a single variable in the abstracted model. But then let's keep the thing simple. And finally, the last element of the abstraction is actually a collection of functions that maps outcomes of variables in the base model to uh, outcomes of variables in the abstracted model. So we will have one of these alpha map for each node in the abstracted model. So we will have an alpha function from S to S prime, an alpha function from T to T prime, and from C to C prime. So this is supposed to tell us if we have an output for S, to what output of S prime is this mapped to? So for instance, if S takes the value zero, S prime will be zero as well. If S is one, S prime will be one. And what we do is we present it as a matrix, basically. So this matrix, you, you can read this matrix as having outputs in the base model on, on the columns and the outputs of the abstracted model on the rows. So this will tell you that zero in the base model is equal to zero in the abstracted model. And similarly, one on the uh, base model will be one on the abstracted model. And so we have these three red matrices that represent how we map the outcomes of variables to the outcomes of the other variables in the abstracted model. So to sum up and in sort of uh, you know, wrapping up way, so we define a set of variables that we care about. We define how variables are mapped to each other and we define how outcomes or values are mapped to each other. So this is a sort of very exhaustive definition of how two models may be related. Okay, so now if you think about it, uh, once you have two models, you could come up with any sort of abstraction, right? So you could arbitrarily choose what are the relevant variable. You can arbitrarily choose how to map one variable to another, and you could arbitrarily choose how to map outcomes. So this abstraction that I showed, it kind of makes sense, but this is just a definition. So someone could have said, okay, I'm abstracting the smoking variable in the base model to the cancer variable in the abstracted model. And this wouldn't make much sense. So what we need now is a way to decide whether an abstraction is good or not. And the way we do this is by introducing this notion of abstraction error. And the idea is that what we care about, what we want to evaluate is a notion of interventional consistency between the base model and the abstracted model. So suppose that we, we consider, what we're gonna do is to consider interventions and specifically we consider an intervention on a certain variable and the output that we observe on another variable. So if we take the bottom, uh, the, sorry, the top line in this diagram, this represents an intervention on the variable S, so an intervention on smoking. So we force a patient either to smoke or not to smoke. Uh, we uh, skip over ethical implications of this. So here we are intervening on the smoking variable and we are observing how this intervention affect the deposit in the tar, uh, deposits in the lungs. So these represent the variable which intervene, the variable that they observe. 
And so the mechanism connecting these two variables represent the mechanism connected to the distribution of T given that I do the intervention on S. So this is what happens in the base model. In the abstracted model, what we can get is something correspondent, right? So if we have an intervention here on the smoking, now we can use our uh, map alpha uh, S prime to have a corresponding intervention on S prime in the abstracted model. And similarly, we can use the map alpha C prime to, sorry, alpha T prime should be here, to map the, the outcome on T in the base model to the outcome of T prime in the abstracted model. And similarly, these two variables will be connected by this mechanism that represents the intervention distribution of T prime, given that I perform an intervention on S prime. Okay, so we have this diagram. Now, what we want is this, for this diagram to commute, right? So what we would like is that if we perform an intervention on the base model and we abstract to the abstracted model, we get the same result as first abstracting to the abstracted model and performing the intervention. So this captured the idea that we were presenting before from thermodynamics where you can work either on the base level or on the abstracted level and get the same result. So the point is that, okay, if this diagram commute, this is perfect. It means that the two models are exactly one of the, the abstraction of the other and their intervention is consistent. But normally this won't be the case because often abstracting means simplifying things. So we cannot expect a perfect commutativity. So what we do is to consider uh, the difference between the result that we obtain following this path and following this path. And what we do is basically compute a distance between the distribution resulting from this part and the distribution resulting from this part. So what we get is a measure of abstraction error given these two nodes. So given that we intervene on S and we look on the T prime, we compute as the abstraction error the maximum over all the value that I can my, put my intervention at of the JSD so Jensen Shannon distance of the path on the top and the path on the bottom. So this is a measure of interventional discrepancy between these two paths for these two variables. Okay, so this, this is a notion, is a very specific notion of abstraction error related to two variables. In a model, however, we have a number of variables. So as we were discussing the diagram with S and T, we could also discuss the same about T and C or S and C. So this just naturally lead to the idea of having a notion of global abstraction error. So the global abstraction error is just the supremum of the error computed on each diagram. So this is just a, a very like simple generalization or extension of the, the idea of abstraction error, error that we have before. Okay, so this is the framework of abstraction. And then the thing that we do next now is, okay, let's consider the problem where we want to learn an abstraction. So, so far we have discussed the setup where the models were defined, the abstraction is given, and we have found a measure of quality of this abstraction. But what can we do, what can we say if this abstraction is not available? Can we learn a way to relate structural causal models? So this is, this is basically the object of uh, the work that I'm gonna present now, which is joint work that I've been doing with the people at the University of Warwick. And, and what we decided to do is basically start from the first basic, most basic and simple setup, so, or simple problem. So, um, as we've seen, like an abstraction is defined by a tuple of three elements, R, A, and alpha. So the simplest learning problem that you could have is, 
um, how could I learn an abstraction if I have only partial information about it? So suppose that someone has given you the two models and has told you, okay, I have some variables that I care about and I want to be abstracted. And I also know where variables would be mapped. Can we learn the, the maps alpha that would relate the outcome of one variable to the other? So this is the problem that you want to consider. And then in a very like machine learning fashion, what you do is uh, say, okay, so we want to learn the abstraction. We have a measure of point of the abstraction. So let's just phrase it as an optimization problem. So we want to learn the alphas, such as that the abstraction error, the global abstraction error is minimal. So this, this is a, a very intuitive and reasonable statement or reasonable approach at least to start with. But this uh, actually, um, we actually realize it's quite a challenging problem because there are different like um, uh, challenges connected to uh, this optimization problem. So uh, the, first, the first problem is that uh, we have a number of uh, functions alphas to learn. These are defined as matrices in our example because they are like finite. So we have, for instance, if we're considering the problem before, we would have three matrices to learn, but learning each one of them uh, requires the solution of a commutative diagram. And each commutative diagram may, um, may have the same variables. So, if I try to solve this problem, say optimizing for this, for commutativity on this diagram. So if I optimize commutativity on this diagram and I learn alpha S and alpha P, then I would have alpha T appearing again in this other diagram. So there is no very simple or trivial solution uh, where we solve in parallel all these commutative diagrams. Uh, it's also a quite challenging problem because, uh, well, these, these maps are supposed to be functions. So these matrices would be discrete matrices having zero and ones. So it's a combinatorial optimization, which as, yeah, which as, as we know, it's, it's particularly challenging because yeah, it's a discrete optimization problem. There is also another constraint that is normally introduced in abstractions, and this is a constraint of surjectivity. So this means that any um, all the outcomes of S prime should have a corresponding value in the domain of S that maps to them. So here the idea is that if there is some possible configuration of the system in the abstracted model, there should be also configuration in the base model that can be, uh, that can reach that abstracted configuration. So this is a, a, a further constraint on the problem that makes the solution, again, particularly challenging. Okay, but we we kind of uh, tackled this again in a very determined, uh, hard-headed machine learning way. So we decided to uh, do, I mean, what you normally do when you have a discrete combinatorial problem. So we go for a relaxation and a parameterization of the problem. Okay, so what does it mean? So now instead of having the matrix uh, alpha as we had before, now we have a param parametric form for this um, alpha map. So what we say is that the matrices that we are going to learn are going to be defined on R2 instead of uh, instead of being defined on discrete values. So now, now our matrices can take continuous values. So instead of being zero and ones, can take n real value. And then what we did was just doing some tempering of these uh, matrices. So um, see, yeah, I was tempering or soft maxing, if you prefer. So we basically apply functions that uh, rescale the columns so that the columns are pushed to be as close to binary as possible. So if we start from this 
matrix that we see here, and we apply this tempering function or submax function, what we get is well another continuous matrix which is very close to a discrete matrix. Though. So this tempering sort of enhances the differences between the values until they are very close to, to binary. Um, okay, so this, this sort of like uh, solved the, the issue of uh, having, um, um, having a combinatorial problem. So this was the second challenge that we presented. And then we can also directly solve the problem of surjectivity, introducing a penalty constant. So um, subjectivity in this case means that every column of our matrix should have at least a single one. Well, should have at least a one. So what we do is just introduce this very like trivial, if you want penalty function, where basically we just take the maximum of each column and we compute one minus the maximum of each column. So the closest the column is to having a one, the smallest the penalty will be. So for instance, here, the penalty for this column would be one minus 0 0.99, so very small. And here would be one minus 98. So again, pretty small. Um, and again, this is kind of very applied. And there is a last problem, uh, which I think is the most interesting one, which was the fact that we have multiple, as I said, multiple commuting diagrams on which the same um, variables appears more than once. So alpha s prime appears here and here, alpha t prime here and here. So what we do here is basically encode all these matrices in a in a neural network. So what we do is um, we set up a neural networks where we have nodes that represents these mechanisms that are given in, in our models and we have parameters that we are learning. And the way we define the connection in this neural network are defined by these diagrams. So basically, if you take these green diagrams, if you trace the green lines here, you get exactly the same diagram. So one path represents the top path, and the other path represents the bottom path. So this single like neural network captures all these three diagrams at the same time. And at the end, we have the loss function that we have defined. So we have these loss functions that uh, compute the abstraction error and the penalty that we have seen before, of course, scaled with the uh, lambda, and, and which basically allows us to solve jointly for all these three diagrams. OK, so, uh, so yeah, this was the, this basically the approach we have proposed. So we have, then we have tested it. So, so first we have a number of like synthetic experiments. So I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time on this, but, but basically we, we have considered a number of like synthetic experiments. So models that we have defined on paper. So model for which we know what's like the, the optimal solution. And, and we have learned the abstractions using our approach. So we have measured our, um, our approach or our method in terms of like how, how small is the abstraction error that we learn? Uh, how far are we from the, the ground truth that we, um, that we have defined? Because as I said, this is a synthetic experiment, so we know the ground truth. And how like expensive in terms of work clock time they are. And basically we have compared our approach, which is the joint one, to other like uh, kind of um, uh, benchmark, uh, which are based on the idea of either solving all the commuting diagram sequentially or, or independently. Uh, and I mean, and yeah, our approach performed better. I mean, this, this in a way it's not surprising because, well, the competing approach were not very um, eager to solve this, this sort of problem while we are able to exploit this joint information in all, in all the diagrams. 
Um, I think that probably though the, the, the most interesting application of PS came to when we tried to use it for like uh, a real world problem. So what we considered was the problem of uh, the coating of lithium ion battery. So uh, specifically what we wanted to study is uh, how we can control uh, the, the, the thickness of, of the coating of lithium ion battery. So this is called normally mass loading as a function of the different inputs that uh, can be controlled. And, and this is this sort of, uh, well, it's an interesting problem because well, it's a very, it's a very applied problem. So being able to control different stages of production of lithium ion battery is very important to have performant batteries, but it's also very, very um, representative because it's an extremely costly experiment to do. So producing batteries is extremely costing and measuring how well they perform. Again, it's very time consuming because you have to charge and uh, discharge of the batteries. So if we can exploit existing data, this, this, is, this would be a great advantage, a great boost. So what we did is uh, try to, what we did was like collecting uh, data that were available. So we basically uh, retrieved a publicly available data produced by a group in France. So this, this, this group, the LRCS, um, has provided the data for different stages of battery manufacturing. So they have a large amount of data for different stages, but with a very like, uh, um, very, very low resolution. So they collect few statistics in different uh, places of the process. And then we used, uh, well, data collected at the University of Warwick. So this is actually private data collected by the Warwick Manufacturing Group. And this instead was very, very focused, very narrow. This just studies coating and collects a lot of data about them. So a lot of observation, a lot of points. And so, Normally, these two data sets would be incompatible, so it would be very hard to uh, put them together. And what we what we decided to do was try to align them. And specifically, so what we did was to learn an abstraction that would map the WMG data to the LRCS data. So once we once we define that map between the two models we were able to transport the data of the WMG group to the LRC, LRCS data, and then learn uh, a model for controlling uh, the coding process from the aggregated model. And, and basically, okay, this is what, what we're showing here. So what we're showing here is um, um, so um, a prediction problem that we try to solve. Specifically, we consider solving an out-of-sample prediction problem. So the first line shows the performance that we have achieved if we use only the LRCS data set, training out-of-sample, and then testing on the K-sample. And this is the mean square error that we obtain. So on the second line, what we do is, again, train with the LRCS data, all out of sample, plus the WMG data that we have abstracted. And then we test uh, on sample K from the LRCS data. And here we achieve a significantly lower error. And this in a way, um, it's borderline cheating if you want, because uh, the WMG data actually contained the sample K. So, so this is in a little bit of cheating because at this point, this evaluation is not out of sample anymore, but it's a sort of like representative example where you may be trying to learn out of sample from your data. And if you abstract a different data set, suddenly you get the data that would have been out of sample. But we also compute like a more honest, if you want, uh, evaluation, where now we train with the out of sample LRCS, the abstracted data from WMG also out of sample. So we take out the sample that we want to be out of sample and we test with this sample. And again, we obtain like a better mean square error. And again, this, this just comes from the fact that we have more data to describe the, the, the system and the behavior of the system. Um, so yeah, uh, I think just to conclude, um, 
I think uh, so. So we think that uh, uh, both causality and abstractions are very important uh, ideas and tools for like modeling and studying systems. And what we have shown here is basically one of the first like proposal for like learning abstraction between model and also like showing how we can use it for transporting data and hopefully solve like realistic problem. In general, in general, what I, what I, what I would like to say is that uh, like this idea of uh, performing abstraction between causal model is quite novel. So there is actually a big space of possibility for research and work, both in the foundation of these frameworks, but also just like to characterize them in terms of quality errors, or even just to perform like um, studying like algorithmic development or methods for performing abstraction between those models. Yeah. Well, and I think.